The Epstein-Barr virus typically causes an asymptomatic infection or it can cause acute tonsillitis as part of a bigger infection called infectious mononucleosis, also known as glandular fever. Epstein-Barr virus infections typically occurs in adolescents and young adults and is transmitted orally via saliva. This is the reason Epstein-Barr virus infections are also known as the kissing disease. Nearly everyone will be infected with an Epstein-Barr virus at some point. The good thing is that for most of us, it is asymptomatic. You have no symptoms. In this video, we will talk about a, the primary Epstein-Barr virus infection, which is asymptomatic, and how the infection can evolve to become infectious mononucleosis, which is a symptomatic Epstein-Barr virus infection. The pathophysiology of the Epstein-Barr virus infection begins with saliva transmission, and the Epstein-Barr virus targets uh, the tonsils, which is a lymphoid tissue made up of T-cells and B-cells. In the tonsils, the Epstein-Barr virus targets B-cells and the tonsillar epithelial cells. This is called the Epstein-Barr virus primary infection, and this is usually asymptomatic. Once the Epstein-Barr virus infects the B cells, the Epstein-Barr virus has an incubation period of about two to six weeks. Now, during the incubation period, a number of things happen. Firstly, the Epstein-Barr virus replicates in B cells, and the virus is shed intermittently into pharyngeal secretions, particularly saliva, and so saliva is therefore how Epstein-Barr virus is transmitted between people. The cycle can continue and the person can be completely asymptomatic. Of course, during this incubation and reactivation time, the immune system is responding. The Epstein-Barr virus induces an immune response, whereby the B cells, which are your antibody producing cells typically, they can capture this antigen of the Epstein-Barr virus and process it. The B cells can mount an immune response locally in the tonsils and the B cells can enter circulation and mount an immune response elsewhere in the lymph nodes usually, the spleen and the liver. Here, the B cells stimulate CD8 T cell activity. CD8 T cells are also known as cytotoxic T cells and are important in the suppression of primary Epstein-Barr virus infection. On a side note, the CD8 T cells are thought to be important players in preventing Epstein-Barr virus reactivation and Epstein-Barr virus associated lymphoproliferative disease. The B cells also activate CD4 T cells through co-stimulation, which means the B cells also become activated. This is important because activated B cells become plasma cells, and the plasma cells are the antibody producing cells. The plasma cells will produce Epstein Barr virus specific antibodies, which means antibodies against components of the Epstein Barr virus. Firstly, it will produce the viral capsid antigen with IgM, followed by the viral capsid antigen with IgG. Plasma cells then eventually produce Epstein-Barr nuclear antigen IgG once the infection is resolved. The activation of other immune cells in the lymph nodes, spleen, and liver is part of the immune response against Epstein-Barr virus. During the incubation period, the Epstein-Barr virus can also enter circulation. Here, the immune cells in the blood will try to destroy it and also I will pick it up and mount an immune response, releasing cytokines. And this interaction is one of the reasons why the Epstein-Barr virus infection can uh, produce symptoms such as fevers and uh, feeling of uh, malaise. During the incubation period, the abnormal infiltrated B cells produce these antibodies called heterophile antibodies, which are actually important and a quick marker for diagnosing Epstein-Barr virus infection. A very important concept to understand is that an Epstein-Barr virus primary infection is typically asymptomatic. However, in some cases, the immune response to the infection can be so great, causing symptoms of infectious mononucleosis. 
As mentioned, Epstein-Barr virus infection transitions from the oral cavity to the peripheral blood to other parts of the body, including the spleen, liver, and lymph nodes. In these sites, an immune response against Epstein-Barr virus is mounted thanks to B cells and macrophages triggering CD8 and CD4 T cell response. The immune response results in lymphadenopathy from lymphoid proliferation. The immune response can also occur in the spleen and in the liver, causing splenomegaly and hepatomegaly. It is important to understand the antibody response to Epstein-Barr virus and what they mean. Here is a graph with time on the x-axis and concentration of things on the y-axis. So for example, the Epstein-Barr virus infection begins in the oropharynx with the infection of the tonsils, displayed like so. Epstein-Barr virus can then enter circulation, displayed like so. The first antibody produced is viral capsid antigen IgM. Here is IgM coming up. IgM is a marker of a current Epstein-Barr virus infection. And now this is followed by the viral capsid antigen IgG. Note it takes a while for the IgG to be produced. So when IgM and IgG are produced, the Epstein-Barr virus levels drop as depicted. Eventually, when the immune system is controlling the Epstein-Barr virus infection, the plasma cells are able to produce Epstein-Barr nuclear antigen IgG, which will be a marker of the resolution of the infection and a marker for a previous Epstein-Barr virus infection. Unfortunately, it's important to keep in mind that even though IgM is the first antibody to be produced, as mentioned, it is high in the blood for up to 120 days. So technically, it can be a marker of a current infection or a marker of a recent infection. The clinical features of infectious mononucleosis include tonsillitis, pharyngitis, fevers, generalized malaise, lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, and leukoplakia. Here is an image of a tongue with leukoplakia. Note the whitish grayish patches on the tongue, on the side of the tongue. The tonsils are typically covered with an extensive grayish white exudate. The tonsils can be so large it can compress the airways. Here is a photograph of someone with infectious mononucleosis. You can see this person's got uh, pharyngotonsillitis. You can see the white grayish exudate in the tonsils and the enlarged tonsils at that. Diagnosis of infectious mononucleosis uh, is often clinical. Epstein-Barr virus pharyngotonsillitis should be suspected in anyone with fever, pharyngitis, and cervical lymphadenopathy. Investigations findings include increased lymphocytes in the blood, presence of the heterophile antibodies, this is called the monospot test. And remember, these were produced by the abnormal B cells. Other tests include the Epstein-Barr virus specific antibodies, which can be ordered, and as discussed, include the viral capsid antigen IgM and the viral capsid antigen IgG, the Epstein-Barr nuclear antigen IgG. Another expensive investigation that can help diagnose difficult cases of Epstein-Barr virus infection include PCR for the Epstein-Barr virus DNA, which can detect Epstein-Barr virus in blood or also in the cerebrospinal fluid from a lumbar puncture. A throat swab should be done if concerns of a bacterial infection, as one of the main differential diagnoses of an Epstein-Barr virus infection is group A streptococcus infection, known as strep throat. So in summary, the Epstein-Barr virus infection is usually asymptomatic. If Epstein-Barr virus infection causes symptoms, it can be part of a condition called infectious mononucleosis. Here, we will be mainly focusing on infectious mononucleosis. Infectious mononucleosis most often begins insidiously with fatigue, vague malaise, 
followed by several days later of a sore throat, pharyngotonsillitis, headaches, fevers, swollen cervical lymph nodes. In some people, there can be hepatomegaly, leading to complications such as hepatitis, and splenomegaly, which can lead to complications such as a splenic rupture, which is also a presentation of infectious mononucleosis. Epstein-Barr virus is a virus which is part of the herpes virus family and is transmitted via saliva. That is why Epstein-Barr virus infection is also known as a kissing disease. Once in the body, the Epstein-Barr virus targets B cells in the oropharynx, such as the tonsils. Here, they replicate and conquer as the body builds up an immune response. Investigations of infectious mononucleosis includes a full blood count, which may show lymphocytosis, thrombocytopenia. Other investigations to order include EUCs, LFTs, and CRP. A monospot test is a useful test to perform, and it's quick. A monospot test looks at heterophile antibodies in the blood, which are produced by those abnormal B cells infected by the Epstein-Barr virus. Further, investigations that can be performed include Epstein-Barr virus-specific antibodies. Finally, a throat swab is also very important to differentiate bacterial causes such as Streptococcus pyogenes. Treatment for symptomatic Epstein-Barr virus infections, which is infectious mononucleosis, is usually conservative and include pain and temperature uh, management using ibuprofen and paracetamol. Important to uh, tell patients to have rest, enough fluids, and nutrition. Primary Epstein-Barr virus infections rarely require more than supportive treatment. Rarely, the enlarged tonsils can cause airway compromise, and if it does, it's important to admit them to hospital. They will likely need ENT involvement. Steroids are given to hopefully reduce the swelling. Nasopharyngeal airway intubation, emergency tonsillectomy or tracheostomy may be required in very, very severe cases. Complications of infectious mononucleosis include splenic rupture, leukoplakia, Burkitt's lymphoma, and lymphoproliferative disease later on in life. In some cases, Epstein-Barr virus tonsillitis is treated with antibiotics accidentally because it looks like a bacterial infection of the throat. And usually ampicillin is prescribed. When ampicillin is prescribed for an Epstein-Barr virus tonsillitis, it may cause a fine macular rash in up to 90% of people. The mechanism is unknown, and straight away you can just stop the antibiotics and the rash will go away. I hope you enjoyed this video on Epstein-Barr virus infection and infectious mononucleosis. On a side note, infectious mononucleosis can also be caused by other viruses, but typically Epstein-Barr virus is by far the most common cause.